Hello, everyone. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be recording here for Comi. It's unfortunate that we're not all in France having a great time together. However, I would like to still uh, discuss with you the tumor microenvironment and how it regulates disease progression from MGUS to multiple myeloma. And hopefully uh, in the future, we will all meet together uh, and uh, discuss that in person. So these are my conflicts of interest. And I'll take you back a little bit and think, why is the tumor microenvironment so important? For many years, we've talked about cancer as the disease of the tumor cells and talking about how the early events happen, potentially because of an uh, early germline risk allele, you have one change, one initial driver event that leads to further progression of the clone. And then you acquire several uh, other driver events, potentially immune evasion, and then finally you have the clone or multiple subclones until you develop the disease, and in this case, multiple myeloma. What we know in multiple myeloma is indeed we have primary genetic events, hyperdeployed and non-hyperdeployed, that may occur even at early stages as MGUS. And then these progress on into the asymptomatic stages of smoldering myeloma, starting to acquire secondary events like MRAS, KRAS mutations. And then finally, by the time we see patients with overt myeloma, you have at least sub, sub five subclones with many of them having multiple uh, genetic events, including KRAS and RAS, MIC translocations, and so on. However, the question is truly, what is the contribution of the tumor microenvironment? And the other question is, even in MGUS, we see patients who have early genetic events, who have a 414 translocation or even KRAS mutations. Yet you ask the question, why did this patient not progress to overt myeloma? And another patient who has the same exact genetic events, a 414 translocation, a KRAS mutation, progresses rapidly within a few years to overt myeloma. So you start asking the question whether clonal evolution is also regulated by the tumor microenvironment and whether the micro environment is not just a bystander, but actually an active contributor in that clonal um, heterogeneity that occurs and that leads to progression of myeloma. So in our lab, we've been working on taking it in a different approach where we take patients with MGUS and smoldering because we want to ask the question of an early event and how that leads to progression. And we dissect it apart into genetic and epigenetic events that occur in the tumor cells. Can we understand clonal evolution through this tumor compartment, but then stepping back and taking from the same patient their tumor microenvironment, whether immune or non-immune cells, contribution of stroma, endothelial cells, and others, and asking the question whether these are truly regulators of active uh, progression to overt myeloma. And by doing that, we take it back into translational research, asking the question, can we develop signatures that predict progression for people, for patients, so that we don't sit with a patient with smoldering myeloma and tell them uh, that we cannot understand truly what are the factors that will lead to progression for them, but in fact, give them signatures that are either based on genomic events or based on immune events that can help them decide whether they can go on therapy or not. And also develop what we call precision interception, where you actually have a specific treatment for patients based on their specific signatures. We know that in myeloma, so many subtypes are there. That's why we call it multiple myeloma in a way. Yet at the end of the day, we treat patients the same way, RVD, KRD. We want to change that in smoldering myeloma. We want to treat patients based on their own signature and based on their own uh, precision, basically, so that we're not over-treating or under-treating patients. So why, again, going back to MGUS and smoldering? Because it's the early event. And because it's not interrupted by treatment, so you do not have the other factors that could be confounding all of the changes that you see in the microenvironment. So that's why we're going from an early normal cell to MGUS in the preneoplasia area and asking the question, what are those events, driver events, even in the immune microenvironment that lead to progression to cancer? Now, MGUS and smoldering are very interesting because they're asymptomatic stages, yet as you go on in progression to smoldering disease and you have more tumor cells in the bone marrow, you start seeing heterogeneity in the clinical progression. Some patients progress very rapidly within five years, and some patients may never progress in their lifetime. And you truly want to understand how can we dissect those apart? How can we define what changes in a permissive microenvironment or a non-permissive microenvironment in those patients? And can we harness that for us? Can we use immunotherapy in the future to change the way that patients are uh, developing progression so that you can change that environment to become a non-permissive environment? Can you change it back to a normal environment in those patients? 
So I'll take you through two steps that we've done sort of dissecting that uh, early event apart. First, looking at the tumor clone and then looking back at the tumor and microenvironment and how we can put them together. So the first thing that we've done, and this is in a JCO that will be out hopefully in the next week or so, so it will be available by the time you see this presentation. Uh, and this is trying to characterize by whole exome sequencing and deep targeted sequencing, the genomic characteristics of patients with smoldering myeloma. And we have here 214 patients. And this is one of the largest studies to try and truly understand what leads to progression in smoldering myeloma. And can we understand clonal heterogeneity in those patients? Now, as you can see here, many of those patients have the point mutations that we've seen in myeloma, MAP kinase mutations, KRAS and RAS, you can see also P53, ATM, and so on. And of course, many of the um, uh, copy number alterations that are very well known for multiple myeloma. However, what's interesting is when you divide the subgroup of patients who never had therapy, and we have over five years of follow-up in those patients into progressors and non-progressors, and forget the clinical markers, forget if they have 2220, forget if they have high-risk uh, markers by um, light chain or plasma cells, and just say, can I define genomic markers that can predict progression in those patients who had a long time of follow-up, so at least three to five years of follow-up? You can find, indeed, that there is a huge difference between the progressors and the non-progressors. As you can see here, the non-progressors, many of them have no point mutations. In fact, most of the KRAS and RAS, P53, ATM, ATR mutations and mixed uh, amplifications and translocations are showing up only in the progressors. So that led us to developing a significant um, biomarkers or multiple biomarkers that can be used to predict progression in those patients. And these were divided into three main ones. Make alterations, whether they're amplifications or translocation. And as you can see here, independent of clinical factors, uh, you have a huge difference in the progression, as you can see in the Kaplan-Meier, of patients who have a MYC alterations versus the ones who do not have the MYC alterations. MAP kinase mutations and RAS, KRAS, and BRAF, again, huge difference in the progression rate, uh, one and a half years versus 5.2 years. And then the DNA repair mutations, and again, huge difference of 1.3 years versus 4.3 years. Now, if you add those genomic markers to the well-known clinical markers, whether the Mayo Clinic criteria or even the 2220, that still persists uh, in a multivariate model, showing you that genomic aberrations are still important, even if you uh, put together the clinical markers. Now, why is this important? I can tell you clinically when I see a patient and they have 2220 or they have high risk uh, markers by the clinical criteria that we use today, we cannot really sit down with them and tell them with a good prediction that we know when they will progress or not. So I think this adds to that uh, prediction models to have more accuracy when you sit down with a patient and tell them whether indeed they will progress. And we're hoping that this will be used in the future uh, as a method to really define patients who have a high risk of progression to myeloma. And these are the ones that should be entered into clinical trials currently to prevent progression in those patients. Now, interestingly, when we looked at the phylogeny uh, with sequential samples of patients at five years of progression, so the first sample and then five years afterwards when they developed myeloma, or at 14 months, or at eight years in a non-progressor, we found a very interesting thing. We found that every single mutation that we can find in multiple myeloma was also present, although at a very small subclonal uh, level, even in the smoldering stage. Now that tells you that smoldering myeloma is already a very mature tumor, that it has all of the changes that occur already in myeloma. And in fact, you may look at the smoldering myeloma sample and define all of the genomic aberrations that you would find in the patient when they progress to myeloma. That's actually very interesting because now for the first time we say that smoldering myeloma is already a mature complex disease, although very small subclones are there. And a few of those subclones are the ones that will progress and overtake basically the rest of the tumor, as you can see here, KRAS or NRAS in a couple of those tumors. And for the non-progressor, it was completely stable. The clones were there at the smoldering stage and never changed. They were basically static throughout the eight years of progression. And again, that's interesting because it tells you that something is happening, potentially the tumor microenvironment in a patient like this, that per keeps the clones completely persistent, completely static, without any evolution in them.
So that takes us basically to the question of the tumor microenvironment. And we were intrigued to ask the question, well, what happens in an MGUS patient? What happens with progression? Do, does the tumor microenvironment change? And many of us in the old days, we used to say MGUS is a benign disease. There is nothing wrong with them. The patients are normal because they're asymptomatic. And we truly asked the question, is the immune microenvironment completely normal in an MGUS patient? In fact, we were expecting it to be just like a normal bone marrow. And here I'm showing you again uh, by single cell RNA sequencing of patients uh, of normal healthy individuals, MGUS samples, small ring myeloma samples, whether they were high risk clinically or low risk clinically, and then overt myeloma. And the first thing we found is that uh, the subtypes of T cells, NK cells, CD14 monocytes, and so on, cluster separately, as you can hear, as you can see here in the Disney uh, plot. And then, if you try to put those plots uh, by enrichment, going from a normal bone marrow, which is in blue, to a multiple myeloma bone marrow, which is in red, and you have the stages of MGUS and smoldering in between, you start seeing something very interesting. There are subsets of NK cells that are increasing in the bone marrow as you go on to myeloma, knowing that these are dysfunctional in nature. Sub sets of T cells, specifically T regs, were increasing significantly in that bone marrow as you progress to myeloma. And effector T cells, especially uh, the ratio between effector and memory T cells, was uh, altered as you progress. So you have less of the memory T cells in uh, as you go on to overt myeloma. And then specific subsets of CD16 monocytes, macrophages, were also significantly altered. The other thing that was interesting, and I'll show you to you in details, is even at MGUS, at an early stage of MGUS, the bone marrow microenvironment was already altered. So in fact, we have so many immune changes that occur even at a very early tumor clone. And the question is whether this came first and then that leads to plasma cell alteration and further progression, or is the small number of plasma cells that are already genomically altered capable of changing the immune microenvironment so rapidly and whether that's important again for early progression or not. So here are some of those examples. And again, this paper uh, is in Nature Cancer in Press. It will be out within the next week. Uh, and you're welcome, uh, again, to look at it in more details. But here is the composition of healthy NK cells or healthy immune cells in general. You can see NK cells, CD16 monocytes, and so on. And then as you go on to myeloma progression from MGUS to smoldering myeloma and then to overt myeloma. And interestingly, you can see here that the NK cells and CD16 monocytes are the ones that significantly change as you go on from a healthy individual, which are the light blue, into a myeloma, even in MGUS stages, as you can see here in those six MGUS cases. So again, that was interesting to see that at M MGUS stage, you're seeing already NK cells and CD16 monocytes changing. The other thing is the subsets of NK cells, many of them that are in the bone marrow that have high NK levels in the bone marrow was, were also expressing high CXCR4. Now we know that CXCR4 is a chemokine receptor that leads to uh, cell trafficking or uh, having the cells sit in the bone marrow. And that was important because potentially this could be a therapeutic a uh, way for us to look at those NK cells and targeting them if they are dysfunctional and not actually helping kill the myeloma cells. The other thing was the subclustering of T cells. So we uh, applied a new method called the NMF, which actually gives you further subclustering, further resolution of the gene signatures within the T cell subsets. And here you can see that we were able to find seven different subsets of immune T cells, whether they were uh, CD4 cells or CD8 cells, and then even taking it further into subsets of interference signaling or granzyme um, a and granzyme B. So here you can see, um, as we put together the cytotoxic T cell populations and look at what is changing in them, in orange here you can see that the memory cytotoxic T cells start to completely change from a normal bone marrow where you have many of those orange bars basically, to when you go to myeloma, almost none. You completely lose your memory cytotoxic T cells. And again, that's an interesting area where immune therapy can help recover again the memory T cells. Uh, and I can tell you, Ken Anderson many times told me the way to cure potentially myeloma is activating again your memory T cells. Uh, and I always remember that when I look at that graph and think, indeed, if you can repopulate a memory T cell potentially we can help. Um, the other area was that shift of 
the T factors, as you can see here, and T memory. So as you can see in this graph, as you go on from a healthy individuals to myeloma, you can see that the signature seven, which was related to the memory T cells, keeps increasing. And signature four, which is related to effector T cells, um, or sorry, the memory T cells keeps decreasing. And signature four, which is related to effector T cells, keeps uh, increasing. So again, there was a shift in the cells between uh, signature four and signature seven, indicating that indeed you lose your memory T cells and you have only effector T cells. Now, T regs are also very important. And we had published previously in JCI a few years ago that if you deplete Tregs, you can actually control completely progression of myeloma. And here again, you can find a significant increase in Tregs as you go from healthy to MGUS to smoldering myeloma to overt myeloma, indicating again that these T regulatory cells are essential uh, bad players basically in the progression of myeloma. And then finally, we found that it's not only composition of uh, cells and cell types, but also secretion of specific subsets of um, signaling pathways, including interferon alpha being high in subsets of T cells as well as CD14 monocytes. So both types, immune cells as well as uh, CD16 and CD14 monocytes, were having this high level of interferon alpha signaling. So if you look at the model basically of immune microenvironment dysregulation from healthy individual or from normal bone marrow to MGUS and small ring to overt myeloma, we find that indeed, even at the early stages of MGUS, you have many of the compositional alterations. NK cells increase, CC16 monocytes increase, and Tregs increase. And that increase goes on until you have myeloma. Then you also have image, uh, and I didn't show that in details because of the time, MHC2 uh, internalization, and that leads to actually altered um, uh, present, antigen presentation um, in uh, those cells, especially macrophages. Then you go to altered uh, or depletion of memory CD8 T cells that occurs later on from smoldering myeloma to overt myeloma. And then finally, the later stages, you have an interferon response in those cells. And you can potentially think of many ways to change that to develop immunotherapy that can alter that progression from MGUS to smoldering to overt myeloma. Now, in the last few minutes, I'd like to tell you what else can we do? What are the big ideas that we have here in trying to understand genomic and uh, microenvironmental changes in, the, uh, in patients with MGUS and smoldering? We asked a question, which is a very simple question, is we know currently that in any other cancer, uh, when you diagnose those patients early, like in uh, mammography, you screen for it, and when you find an early lesion, you actually intervene early to prevent progression. And this is a model that many cancers develop. In fact, uh, if you tell anyone, why don't you wait for breast cancer to metastasize, and then you treat those patients because they'll become symptomatic at that time, uh, people will be laughing at you. We know that MGUS is actually a very common disease. In fact, we know that 3% of the population over the age of 50 have MGUS, and in, uh, in uh, African Americans, this is three times higher. And in people who have a family member with myeloma or MGUS, it's two to three times higher. So many of us are walking around asymptomatic with MGUS, which is a high predictor of developing myeloma and potentially a way for us to prevent myeloma progression, yet we don't look for it and we don't screen for it. So we started the PROMISE study, which is the first US cancer screening study for multiple myeloma, where we ask for high-risk individuals. These are uh, about 50,000 individuals we're looking for who are either African-American over the age of 45 um, or uh, people who have a first-degree relative of multiple myeloma. And we are recruiting those people so that we can detect in general, if we look for serum protein electrophoresis or mass spectrometry in those 15,000 individuals, we may be able to find positive people who are 3,000 or so patients. Um, and by doing that, then we can define genomic characteristics, epigenetic characteristics, as well as, of course, microenvironmental and macroenvironmental characteristics that lead to progression. So we're working with the School of Public Health, uh, with many other people, including uh, Dr. Ivan Borello, to try and develop this multi-modalities uh, to try and understand what causes progression in those patients. And by doing that, we can then intervene specifically in the patients who will progress to myeloma in their lifetime and prevent that progression. And our hope is truly that myeloma will not be diagnosed anymore when you have symptoms. We can actually diagnose it early and prevent it before it causes myeloma progression to CRAB criteria. 
So this is a PROM study. It's an enrollment that happens uh, nationwide. It's actually online. So it's a very easy thing. Patients, it's empowering patients to go online, see if they are uh, eligible, and then we send them kits wherever they live in the US. And now we're going to actually open it in Canada, as well as in South Africa, to expand the cohorts and to truly look at the uh, racial differences, as well as um, African Americans in the U.S. versus Africans in South Africa to try and understand better mechanisms of uh, progression in multiple myeloma. Now, I can tell you it's been very hard to recruit African Americans. Um, so we've put a task force specifically for that. We wanted to make sure that we get at least 20% recruitment. Uh, and uh, this led to further work that we've been looking at in looking at disparity programs, as well as how to improve uh, awareness uh, in um, um, uh, our um, uh, patients who are African-American or African in origin. And I can tell you that we are at 16% recruitment um, and many of us are really trying to work to get it even to higher than that. Now, how do we do that? We try to do it all uh, nationwide by recruitment virtually, by mail, as well as of course, boots on the ground with many of the people really going into every community and talking about the promise study. And we've done uh, interviews. I can tell you, I was uh, very lucky to talk to Bob Kyle and Ken Anderson about this uh, study. So you're welcome to look at it. We've also been on um, uh, news channels. We've uh, interviewed Tom Brokaw. As you can see here, Ken Anderson and I went to New York City and interviewed him. And it was wonderful to hear uh, from this giant in the news about his diagnosis of myeloma and how that can potentially help us all to understand uh, and how to prevent myeloma in the next uh, generation of patients. Uh, this is just showing you some of the boots on the ground work. Um, and here is uh, some of our people working in uh, the health fairs or even talking to some of the representatives uh, in Congress to try and improve awareness uh, for myeloma disparity programs. And then, of course, for people who are diagnosed already with MGUS and smoldering, we have a whole clinic only for prevention of progression, only focusing on those patients, but it's also for all hematological malignancies uh, in precursor conditions. So we look at CHIP mutations, we look at MBL, we look at very early events. We work with cardiologists because we know that CHIP mutations can lead to a higher uh, deaths from cardiovascular disease, uh, and truly it's an integration um, of research and clinical care in those patients. Uh, and this is, again, a, a nationwide program. It's actually now international. P crowd is available for any patient, uh, U.S. or international, to uh, enroll on it. Again, it's uh, empowering patients to go online, sign up the consent on their own without any physicians, and then we uh, they can help us get their blood or bone marrow samples and then their clinical data. And through that, we have over 3,000 patients signed up with multiple sequential blood as well as bone marrow samples through progression from MGUS uh, to myeloma. So I'll stop here. I know I speak very fast, but uh, I wanted to cover a lot of data on how we can understand uh, genomic evolution as well as immune microenvironmental uh, effects uh, in disease progression from MGUS to myeloma. And I think there are so many future questions to be answered. Uh, what is the true contribution of those cells uh, if we remove one uh, after the other, which is what we're trying to do now with functional uh, studies? Can we truly understand whether they are critical regulators or they're um, being altered by the tumor clone uh, and are not that essential for tumor progression? When do they change? Does it happen before or after the early uh, genomic event of plasma cell dyscrasia? Um, and are there specific interactions of certain immune cells with genetic subtypes? Is a P53 mutant cell uh, changing certain immune cells uh, or not? Uh, can we define immune signatures that correlate with worse prognosis? Can we develop immune therapies that are specific for subsets of patients who have immune dysregulation so that it's not in uh, all size uh, or it doesn't have to be every patient gets the same therapy, but rather subdividing or having precision interception in those patients, even in the immune system. Uh, so looking at certain immune signatures and then defining those patients to be eligible for certain trials. Uh, so with that, I'll stop and uh, thank, of course, my wonderful team, clinical and lab teams, our founders from uh, Stand Up to Cancer, NIH, MMRF, Leukemia Lymphoma Society, and above all, our patients. Uh, and again, we're looking for postdocs all the time. Thank you.